All right, hello and welcome uh, to our uh, presentation on the personalized teacher development and evaluation tool. We're very excited to talk about how you can incorporate competency-based education tenants into teacher development and evaluation. Uh, but before we get going here, I'd like to uh, introduce our, our presenters today. And, um, and uh, so if you wanna have Dr. Gatto start and we'll move from there. Hi, my name's um, Jenny Gatto. I am the Chief Academic Officer for Westminster Public Schools. And uh, I'm Dr. Brian Casina, Director of Teaching and Learning in Westminster Public Schools. Um, Dr. Marzano. Sorry. Um, my name is Bob Marzano. I am with Marzano Resources, but also with uh, Empower Learning. Um, and uh, uh, Scott Bacon. My name is Scott Bacon, and um, I'm with the Center for Competency Based Education. We've been uh, working for the last 20 years in um, supporting the model with uh, technology and resources. Thanks, everybody. And uh, Westminster Public Schools has been um, not only partnered uh, with the uh, Empower Learning, but also with Dr. Marzano for uh, 10 plus years on implementing and practicing competency based education. And so the partnership you're going to from that partnership came uh, actually the one of the tools that came out of that is today's topic. And so we're excited to kind of show you how we uh, are applying this in action today. Um, so the session agenda is we're going to be talking about why competency based education, uh, not necessarily defining what competency based education is and why it should be done in schools, but more how can we use the tenets of competency-based education when looking at uh, teacher observation, development, and evaluation? Uh, and so we'll be looking uh, at the founded, uh, how we designed an instructional model based off of competency-based tenants. And then how we, using that instructional model, we create an observational system and teacher development tool that is built around that competency-based instructional model and some of the differences that, the, that that brings to not only teacher development, but also then classroom observation and, uh, and ultimately how a school pro provides instruction to its students. Um, so, and then we'll, uh, the case study is gonna be Westminster Public Schools and, and more specifically, uh, not just at the district level, but also at John E. Flynn and Marzano Academy which is the Dist, uh, Westminster Public Schools Instructional Resource and Laboratory School. And so it has been piloting a lot of these tenants and, and practices the last several years. And, and so we'll be able to show you kind of what this looks like in action. Um, and I was actually the principal of that school up until uh, May of this year. So the piloting actually was done by myself as, as well as the teachers over there at Johnny e. Flynn. So we'll be able to share that case study with you along the way. All right, so um, one thing that we want you guys to begin with is really starting to think about removing the old imagine or the old tenants of uh, traditional teacher evaluation and development. And so if we could imagine for a minute a world where we built in the tenants of competency-based education into our educator development model. And then in addition, the classroom observations and the teacher evaluation program are aligned to that school's adopted competency-based instructional model. I know uh, here in Colorado, as I'm sure is across the, the case across the country, we currently have a statewide teacher evaluation tool that is based off of the, the state's um, standards for professional practice. And although they are just fine standards, they don't, in Westminster, we are a, a K-12 competency-based school district, and a lot of the state's standards for teacher performance and uh, instructional elements are not actually aligned to a competency-based model. And so it's kind of tough to have one foot in the traditional model and then the other foot in the competency-based model when you're looking at teacher development and evaluation. 
And so our, what this is gonna be is the ability to try to see what happens when you can marry those two together. Um, and then finally, with that state model that we were just discussing, as I'm sure is the case with pretty much every traditional model, artificial constraints of academic years are built in. So every single year, a teacher evaluation uh, starts again, brand new, fresh, as if the previous years never happened and principals are required to observe and teachers are required to demonstrate uh, maybe, maybe hundreds of instructional uh, practices every year, even if they already demonstrated that exact teacher practice, let's say in April of the previous year. So what would happen if we actually removed those artificial constraints of an academic year to measure teacher effectiveness? And so we'll discuss that as well. All right, uh, Dr. Marzano, do you mind uh, sharing with us the why use a, a competency-based approach to teacher observation and development? And uh, also, what, was, what do you believe is some of the limitations of the traditional model of teacher evaluation and development? Uh, certainly. The, um, uh, well, in my background for decades, I've been interested in what's the research and application of uh, research on instructional strategies and the application in the classroom. And, and there's, there's quite a bit, there, there really is. And so I would say in a traditional classroom, there's a great large theory base, research base to guide you to what strategies to use and you know, what specific situations. Uh, however, that's not the case when you're talking about a classroom or a school that has a competency-based system. Um, and so that, that was the, the intent here was to take what we know from the literature on traditional uh, instruction or traditional classroom and then apply that to a competency-based system. Uh, now, here's the good news. Many, I would say, 80% of the strategies in a traditional classroom transfer over to a competency-based classroom. However, uh, many of those strategies have a slightly or not so slightly different twist uh, in a competency-based classroom. So that was one of our challenges, and that was to which strategies transfer over uh, and um, uh, uh, what changes have to be made. Uh, I also think it's about 20%, and in, in, in the model we'll, we'll, we'll present to you now, 20% of those strategies you typically don't find uh, in a traditional classroom. Uh, so all in all, you've got kind of a very, you know, a very different, uh, somewhat similar, but, but in many cases, very different approach uh, to in instruction. So that's kind of one piece of the, the effort. Uh, but there's another piece, as Brian kind of highlighted, and that is, um, uh, kind of two uses of the word competency-based here. You can have a model that is designed to be used in a competency-based classroom, and you can have a model that's also competency-based itself. In that, when teachers, um, uh, when teachers, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate that they are competent in an area, why do we have to keep assessing that over time? Um, uh, in all cases, there should be the transparency and consistency of expectations to teachers. Uh, you should have a system uh, that teachers know where they are at in their development at any point in time. Uh, and that I just, if you, if you say, well, wait a minute, that's the expectation for how we interact with students too. That's, it, yes, it, it, exactly. Uh, and also in the system that we're talking about that we, um, we use what's called evergreen data. And that was actually, uh, Scott Bacon coined that term a number of years ago, which is a powerful concept, means that the data never goes away. Instead of every year, let's say I'm a teacher in a competency-based classroom, you evaluate me on the same strategies every year, starting from ground zero. Actually, I have a track record, a history that never goes away. You can look how effective I was at executing competency-based strategy X, you know, 15 years ago and how I've progressed over time. Uh, thanks, Bob. And then let me uh, get back on to here, see if I can, here we go. Uh, so if you also want to just discuss some of the constraints of the traditional observation model, Dr. Marzano, as well as how we can, in, in theory, how a, a CBE system can enhance teacher development more than maybe so than a, a traditional model. Um, uh, definitely, yes. The uh... 
Well, the in the last decade, I would say we've learned a lot about uh, you know um, teacher feedback and teacher development. I'd say primarily um, from the MET study, if you remember that measures of effective teaching, uh, and that sprung out of a race to the top legislation. I'm sure you all remember that during the uh, Obama, uh, President Obama's administration, or Arne Duncan was the Secretary of Education, uh, and it was a noble effort. It really was. The idea was that. Uh, they were going to put a lot of money, billions of dollars, actually, uh, into teacher development and teacher evaluation. I think the development part kind of got left off and focused on uh, you know, teacher um, e uh, e e evaluation. Um, I, uh, and uh, simultaneously, the Gates Foundation uh, sponsored this major study. And to date, it's the biggest study uh, e e ever done. Um, and uh, they issued a final report. Oh, gee, not that long ago, actually. It's just if you just look it up, you know, it's free on the you know, on the internet. But he, here's what they found among a lot of problems: um, the uh, the uh, the amount of times you actually have to observe a teacher to uh, obtain a valid and comprehensive perspective on what they do. Uh, is way more than the number of observations that are actually made. And you get different numbers from different people. I personally think in our, in our research, you need to at least 10 observations of a teacher to get a feel uh, for what they do in a classroom on a consistent basis. And other people give you other numbers. And I could even be you know, convinced that it should be you know, well more than 10. Uh, also, uh, what makes the issue even more problematic is that if you want a model, if you want to observe teachers or give feedback on a model that will truly help them grow, that model, by definition, will <coughs> excuse me, will consist of a, 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 a large, lar a large array of elements. You can't just, if you want to help development, you can't just give general feedback in five or six or ten categories. It has to be at a very granular level. And my guess is you can see how the problem of frequency of observation now interacts with the necessary necessity of a granular system on, 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 on which you're giving, uh, giving feedback. Um, uh, the um, uh, uh, observation or, or uh, uh, feedback to teachers should also focus on two aspects of what's going on in the classroom. Uh, let's see. OK, sorry, I'm just reading the comment. There. Um, the, um, it should focus on two aspects of what's going, what's going on in the classroom. Uh, one aspect would be what the teacher is doing. Um, and that's usually where we stop teacher observation. Boy, gee, if you're teaching well, I should see this behavior and this behavior and this behavior. Uh, and that's true. You should see that. But there's a step further. You have to see how those behaviors are affecting the student. So therefore, well, what you need is an observation and feedback system that not only identifies what are the important teacher actions, but also what are the outcomes you would expect uh, from the teacher, uh, excuse me, uh, in students, if those actions are in, in fact uh, having their desired effect. Great, thank you, Dr. Marzano. And so what, what our hopeful uh, is to be able to show today is on the left side here, you're gonna see oftentimes, I mean, we, we put this in the context of a CompC-based education initiative, but really this is the case with, with any major institutional tr um, program or process you're trying to put in place is oftentimes when we overlay uh, an, a, a new initiative on top, we can see that all of our existing features or elements of our system sometimes are pointed in different directions or even, even maybe worse, working against one another. And so then that oftentimes leaves us feeling like we have, you know, one foot stuck in one world, one foot stuck in another world, or, or met maybe multiple worlds, depending on the situation. And so what we're hoping to show is that when you create a, a competency-based instructional model that you then build into your teacher development and evaluation process, including teacher goal setting and professional uh, development practices, that we can move more towards the right image here where you start to get all of your different uh, initiatives and, or excuse me, all the different elements of your system, of your school, your district, pointed in the same direction, all working congruently with one another. And so we hope that we can kind of show you guys how we're being able to try to achieve exactly this um, moving forward. So 
Let's talk about a competency-based instructional model. I, most of us know what instructional models are. However, a competency-based instructional model does have some key differences that, that does make it more competency-based. And so I'm gonna have uh, Dr. Marzano describe his competency-based instructional model. And then we're gonna have Dr. Gatto discuss how we actually started with Dr. Marzano's uh, competency-based model in Westminster. And then we adapted that to become our Westminster Public Schools competency-based instructional model. You'll see a lot of similarities, but there are also some differences. Uh, so uh, Dr. Marzano, start with the research-based instructional model that is specifically adapted to address competency-based education. So if you want to kind of just discuss with us um, how you did that and, and why you think that's important. Uh, well, the, as I mentioned, uh, the competency-based model that we created built on the uh, research and theory on uh, instruction over the decades, going back at least, uh, at least five decades. And I said, uh, that's considerable. But the adaptations, uh, 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 there, there literally is adaptation made to every strategy, you know, that's, I shouldn't say that's probably no exaggeration, uh, the vast majority of strategies uh, that uh, uh, you can identify uh, in the past. And, and usually uh, the, uh, uh, the strategies, um, uh, the changes that have to be made in strategies is uh, change from uh, a focus or a context of large group instruction for the most part to small group and individualized instruction. Uh, and that's a big change. So classroom management, a broad term obviously, looks one way when the predominant mode of instruction is teacher in front of the whole class and the whole class doing the same thing uh, uh, versus when predominant mode is that students are working either individually or in small groups and large group ins instruction uh, might be used the minority of time among the three you know approaches uh, uh, individualized in, in, in small group and and that's a very it's it, it's a very different animal it really is um, the um, uh, relative to you know how you use a model that's that's granular I mean you have to scroll up um, the, uh, as I mentioned before, it must be detailed enough that you can give teachers very granular feedback, but you can't, you obviously can't uh, have expectations about all elements of the model. We actually have 49 elements in the model, uh, and each one of those elements has multiple strategies. Uh, so teachers, understandably, will have to, you know, foc should focus on just a few elements uh, at a time. Uh, that's kind of the schematic for the model that we're using. Four domains. Each domain has design questions embedded in them. There are 10 design, er design areas, excuse me, 49 elements, and over 300 strategies. Uh, now, as I said, the model, you know, is a model I've been working on, but Westminster, and this is recommended, you know, that school districts, let's, let's say for argument's sake that uh, uh, your district was going to use this model. You should take the model and make changes that meet, add things, delete things. And so in Westminster, uh, the model is called the WIM, W-I-M. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a good acronym or not a good acronym. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but that stands for the Westminster Instructional Model. And that's really, that's really important and that's really powerful. So thanks, uh, Dr. Marzano. So here we see the, the hierarchy of, of your uh, instructional model, and we're gonna actually show Westminster's here in a minute to show those adaptions. But what I was hoping you could do here is, um, so we, each of the areas it has um, design area. You can see there is a proficiency scales as a design area. And then within the proficiency scales are different instructional elements. So we can see that providing proficiency scales is a teacher instructional element. These are all teacher instructional elements, by the way. Tracking student progress, celebrating success. And then the second design area is assessment with four instructional elements that you can see below that. And so what I was hoping that you could do real quickly is we highlighted just a couple design areas. And I was hoping you could briefly discuss, for instance, with proficiency scales inside of your model, um, how does that look in a competency-based system or maybe different from a traditional system? And, and why did you include proficiency scales in, in your model? Uh, sure. Uh, well, um, 
actually in a traditional model, you might not or probably won't have, you know, a category called proficiency scales. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, you know, driving beliefs I have relative to concept-based education is you have to break down the academic content for a given subject area and grade level into topics, and they're called different things. I like to, I like to call them measurement topics. Uh, and for each one of those topics, you need to have some continuum of knowledge describing to students what the expectations are for them to you know, master that topic and go beyond that topic and also basic information they need uh, to, re to reach proficiency. Uh, and we call those continuum, that continuum, sorry, continuum of knowledge. Well, I we call that uh, proficiency scales. Is the next one assessment? Uh, yep, the next one's assessment. Yeah, this is one of those big changes. Uh, if you look at um, uh, traditional uh, um, models of instruction, they have one category called assessment. That's it. You know, how do we assess students in a fairly straightforward uh, aspect? In a competency-based model, assessment becomes uh, a, 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 a very important part of not just feedback to students, but uh, feedback to school, district, it guides instruction, it guides further assessment. Uh, it's a way of helping students develop agency. Uh, and there are four distinct aspects of good assessments in this model, using obtrusive assessments, uh, and just what it sounds like, those are assessments that you know they're happening, using student-centered assessments, and that's a real different one. You know, you don't find that in many uh, traditional models. Uh, using unobtrusive assessments, by definition, that means students might not even be aware that they're being assessed. And then finally, generating current summative scores. That is a very, very new piece, relatively speaking, in terms of important instructional strategies. Great. And then, um, and I guess this goes hand in hand with the having proficiency scales. Yeah. What does proficiency scale instruction look like? And maybe how does that differ from general instruction, which is right below sure. that? Yeah, well, the, you know, probably said it a couple of times in different ways now, but, but instruction is guided by the proficiency scale. So you don't just say, aha, on this unit, I'm going over topic X. What you do is you look at the proficiency scale or proficiency scales that are being used, and you ask yourself the question relative to this proficiency scale, which by definition is a continuum of knowledge, you know, and you are teaching this particular element on that continuum of knowledge, what is the needed instructional strategy to start with? Uh, and that changes. So, and, and so the, the strategies themselves have been around for a long time, chunking, processing content, recording and representing. Uh, but uh, instead of just executing these in kind of some linear fashion, what you say is this content, you know, what's the best way do I need to chunk this content? And sometimes you don't, uh, given how it's stated or articulated in a proficiency scale. Do I get, need to engage students in cognitively complex tasks, you know, for this? So it's called proficiency scale instruction to send the message that it's your proficiency scale and the continuum of knowledge that tells you the instructional strategy you should be using on a specific element. Now, general instruction, uh, as uh, the name implies, we're going to, oh. Sorry. That's okay. I don't think that one has a circle in it. No, we're going to, the next one, if you want to just mention maybe the, how general instruction is different from proficiency scale, yeah, before yeah, we the, move on sure, to grouping and regrouping. Sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, general, uh, general instruction applies to any content, uh, you know, and really it's driven by student needs. In general instruction, the focus there is to make sure that students are revisiting the content that has been presented pr uh, uh, previously, uh, whether it's re revisited by the to the whole group or by individuals or, 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 or small groups. And, and uh, most importantly, students have the opportunity to revise, review and revise their understanding of the content. And that should be going on always. Uh, grouping and regrouping, uh, major difference uh, between traditional education uh, and a competency-based classroom. This is the heart of a competency-based classroom. We're in a traditional classroom. Grouping and grouping are certainly reused, uh, but it's almost like, I don't know why I think this is now, it's kind of like a condiment, you know? It's something you use sporadically, you know, to make things different. In a competency-based cl classroom, grouping and regrouping are not the condiment. That's the 
whatever is the subject of the sandwich, the meat, <laughs> you know, the <laughs> cheese, whatever, uh, it's there. Uh, that's a major, uh, major difference. And then finally, do you mind speaking a little bit about efficacy and agency and why you built this into your instructional model sure. and what that looks like in the CBE classroom? Yeah, sure. Well, notice the category, the domain. There's four domains, feedback, content, context, and self-regulation, which I would assert you typically, traditionally don't find in traditional classrooms. Uh, and that's all, I mean, uh, you know, uh, you can make a case that, boy, this is the area that is the focus of competency-based education, uh, equal to, if not more important than, uh, mastery of academic content, uh, the ability to self-regulate. And within that, the, er the, the really the fulcrum is efficacy and agency uh, developing that in students. So this, this whole column here, you know, is very different from what you would find in most traditional models of instruction. Uh, and e e e efficacy by definition is helping students develop beliefs, you know, that they can control their own life. They have, you know, uh, some say over, you know, how their life turns out and how the day turns out. Uh, agency is they actually have the skills and opportunities to do so. Uh, and for me, that this is, this is you know, one of the more exciting parts of competency-based education explicitly trying to develop this. And if we're going to do that, then we explicitly have to have instructional strategies that focus on this. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Marzano. So I'm going to have uh, Dr. Gatto step in now, and she's going to talk about how in Westminster Public Schools, we started with this exact instructional model that's in front of you right now. But as Dr. Marzano mentioned earlier, uh, you, you really need to make the instructional model speak to you and to your community. And so, Dr. Gatto, do you want to walk us through um, what that looked like in Westminster? Absolutely. Um, so, again, we, we worked with Dr. Marzano for our 14 years of implementation of our competency-based system um, and started with the original art and science of teaching um, many years ago and then um, moved into the competency-based version of that. But also, as many of you know, as you shift um, into this competency-based world, it's a lot of big differences between traditional education and what we experienced as students ourselves. And um, it's a lot for our teachers to, to wrap their minds around and, and figure out what does this look like inside the classroom. And we found um, we wanted to make all of our systems kind of tie together really nicely um, and also make sure when they read the language within this instructional model that they see Westminster Public Schools um, as they look through it. So we um, took that original version and just um, Kind of reorganized it. We we talk about our five domains, um, twelve design areas, the the observational and non-observational, um, and our model actually has sixty elements. Within each of these, um, we went through and tweaked some language. Um, in Dr. Marzano's version, he talks about um, measurement topics, and early on we used that language and kind of shifted as we're um, basically our our proficiency scales are aligned to the Common Core. And again, to make things really easy for teachers when they go out and try and find and source additional supplemental resources, when you're looking at the common core, they call them domains. And so we just try to make it as seamless as possible for our teachers. Um, so we tweak some of those words within the scale so that when our teachers read it, they see um, Westminster. When we get to the instructional strategies, um, as Dr. Mar Marzano mentioned, there's 30, 300 plus instructional strategies that back each of these elements up. Um, and we have specific things in Westminster like Kagan structures. And so we wanted our teachers that when they read these that they would see those um, specific strategies built into them so they could make connections directly to that professional learning that we do um, ongoing throughout the system. So um, we, we also identified this need to align tools. We, we were using, as Brian said early on, we had our state evaluation tool that looked at basically an instructional model. Then as we did our daily instructional rounds, we were telling teachers, these are the elements we want you to focus on. So we went through and did a crosswalk of um, the, the Marzano instructional model to our state tool and found um, the, really the only missing pieces were everything in the original model are observable in the classroom. There's a few other key pieces of professionalism, as you can see, our new domain is professionalism, um, where we talk about planning and preparing, and then that professionalism and collegiality, which are key pieces for a teacher 
um, but were silent in the original instructional model. So we added and tailored this so that we can hopefully next year, our goal is to step away from the state evaluation tool. Um, and so that we're, we're giving our teachers one guide, one tool, um, and everyone in the system is providing feedback around that one um, resource. Um, the next slide, um, you can see some of the tools that go along with this. And one of the big things that was a selling point for us is the shift from our observations and feedbacks being about teacher behaviors um, in the model. Um, it uses our same 4321 scale that we use with our students. But you can only achieve the developing level two status um, if we see the teacher behaviors being enacted within the classroom. To become um, applying or proficient, in each of these elements, you have to, we have to be able to see student evidence of each one of those elements. And so this um, tool provides that guidance for what, what would we see a teacher doing in the classroom versus what we would see students doing and some really nice guiding questions that we'll talk about in a little bit about how, how do you elicit, um, if you don't see it and you can't observe it in the classroom, what are things that you can ask students? to know that do they really understand what a proficiency scale is and how um, can they put it in their own words. And then of course, there's a, a scale to go along with each one of these as we're trying to build that inner reliability across the system and make sure teachers understand how they progress along that continuum. Thanks, Dr. Gatto. And you guys will see this. So this is an example of the teacher proficiency scale um, for this particular element, you're going to see these types of uh, teacher scales coming back into the classroom uh, observation practice, as well as the way the teachers develop their professional practices are based off of these scales themselves. And so um, <clears throat> we will be talking more about that. Let me go ahead and get us moving here. This is just a blow up of what you guys have already seen. Um, so you can see that uh, this is going the top section of the scale itself right here is that the score twos or the developing is all teacher behavior with uh, with questions that you can ask a teacher um, or a teacher can ask themselves if they're doing a self evaluation on their practice with this. And then the score three and four, it requires the students to now be doing something. And you'll see that there's also a, uh, questions that you can ask students as an observer or as a teacher to see are the students actually um, participating in this particular instructional element when it's being delivered inside of the classroom. And so we, that's kind of the, the, the breaking line between developing and, and applying is you can only become an applying teacher on any of the scales if the students are doing that. We do have a, on, um, in our professionalism category, you could, we do have some that don't include student um, action, obviously, because that's about teacher professionalism, but all of the classroom observational instructional elements include a student section, as you can see here on the right side. Um, and then also, this is on the bottom half of the teacher scale. And once again, as it just provides some additional uh, rubric, like the better, probably the best word to use, about how do you determine whether a teacher is providing scales in a meaningful way? Are they developing? You can see under two right there where the teacher is engaging in an activity, but uh, students maybe are not, or as the three, the teachers engage in all of the score two activities, plus they also have a majority of the students engaging with it as well. And so we'll see that come back here. Um, so now we're gonna talk about Let's put this into action. We have our competency-based instructional model. Now we're gonna have teachers start interacting with it. And the first part of that is, is how do teachers self-assess and then write goals on their, 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 their competencies within that model? And so uh, Scott, if you uh, want to go ahead and um, talk about the, the purpose and importance of the teacher self-reflection, process and then also what that looks like inside of uh, the empower learning tool yeah thanks Brian so um at this point we're going to start to engage uh, some technology and whenever we engage technology for the competency based model we task it uh, with one primary objective which is to answer a simple question what does the learner know now 
And um, we've spent uh, 20 years trying to answer that question. Yes, we have with technology. And, um, and the first um, uh, efforts or the most logical thing that you would do to be able to answer the question, what does the learner know now, is you gather evidence. Well, in the, um, in the uh, in, uh, teacher's instructional model uh, framework, um, we believe the best start in place is simply a, um, a self-reflection or a self-rating, uh, self-evaluation. And um, if you mind, uh, yeah, switching the uh, slide there. So um, they get a very simple form, which um, is basically nothing more than um, kind of displaying to the teachers the, um, uh, the, the various elements organized by the design areas. And you'll notice here, um, like um, here we've got our first element, using obtrusive, obtrusive assessments uh, uh, to evaluate. Um, there are uh, five different designations that you could um, uh, uh, set yourself at. Uh, maybe you're not using it, you're beginning it, developing, applying, or innovating. And um, if, uh, if you were to click on any one of those, um, it would give you the description. If you don't mind, uh, Brian, go to the next slide there. And so in this case, we clicked on developing. And um, so just to refresh you to the teacher, well, what is developing for this specific element? And what I always love about the way um, Bob has organized this is the foundational level is always what practices, behavior, strategies, um, skills do I as a teacher need um, in order to have the effect I, I want in my uh, students? And then his score three or the mastery level, uh, the applying level is, um, is always going to be, well, what is the desired effect um, that we should see in our students after I've had uh, the practice? Um, in place in my classroom. So not only not only it, are we easily set up for um, uh, we're not just telling uh, teachers, hey, have this effect in your um, in your students, but here's the pathway to have that. And here's um, uh, all the tools and resources you need in order to be able to um, um, meet each milestone your behaviors, your strategies, the hone your skills, and then be able to uh, make sure those nurture and manifest in, uh, in our students. So here, again, what we're doing, we're just going through, self-evaluating, um, clear transparency of what all the expectations are. And, um, and the teacher would basically just, uh, if you go back one slide, sorry, Brian, um, they would just select um, which one of these um, uh, scores, if you will, they believe they're at, and it would color in. And um, they could also um, show additional evidence to support their claim, because they're making a lot of claims here. They could um, provide a video for, um, this is how it looks like in my classroom. Here's me interviewing a student and getting you know, their feedback and their understanding. They could uh, also um, advocate for themselves with um, you know, uh, type in text or, or whatever it might be. But um, this is what we would say is um, the good first step. You have no data in the system. You're just starting to integrate with this um, to uh, start to get data. How do teachers feel that uh, where they're at? And then eventually what this does is it creates a dashboard for a teacher and they can see, you can see off to the left, the self eval scores or the self rating scores. Um, now what each one of those boxes are, this isn't a chart form, but each one of those boxes are the elements, the skills, those professional skills that um, the teachers rated themselves on. So it's all compressed down, but um, it just can know that each one of those boxes relates to a skill. And you can see uh, through the coloring and through the, uh, the labeling exactly what they scored themselves. Later on, we'll get into, you see, it's kind of juxtaposed to the um, feedback scores. That's what the, um, the site leaders, when they evaluated what they believe the, uh, they saw as far as the teacher. So you can see kind of the difference there. Great. And so, yeah, just to, to clarify, and I know Scott just mentioned this, but each one of these boxes is uh, an instructional element. And so on the left, the teacher self-evaluated the first element here, which is providing scales. We've been kind of talking about that. The teacher self-evaluated themselves as a one. I, I, I'm not using or I'm, I'm just beginning my practice of that. And then this is fictitious example, just to highlight, but you can see over here, 
the, the observer, the principal or the assistant principal instructional leaders in the school, they observed this teacher doing an applying job, a fantastic job of pro providing scales. And so this might have happened maybe later in the year. The, the self-eval might have been in, in August to the beginning of the school year. And maybe by November, that teacher had moved up to a four and the principal or the assistant principal had actually observed this teacher um, applying as it is to the teacher proficiency scale for providing scales. And so this is kind of what the observational scores are for a teacher. And then over here is where the, the teacher self evaluated themselves at the beginning of the year. And so we're gonna kind of, and then um, the teachers also have the ability to set goals based off of their self eval. So they, they can set a goal on student-centered assessments, which is one of the instructional elements. They can set a goal um, on physical layout of the classroom. And so then they can chart their progress on those goals. And then the blue one is actually the site goals. And we'll talk more about how principals can use uh, their, the teacher self-eval data, collective self-eval data from the site to, to create site goals or, or priorities for professional development moving forward. But we wanted to talk briefly here about how we did this at Johnny Flynn um, and had teachers go ahead and self-assess on this model and what this looked like. So initially, um, once you have all of your teachers self-assess, you may end up with each one of your areas. Proficiency scale instruction is the, is the design area. Down here is general instruction design area. And you're gonna be able to see that you have, you know, a majority of my teachers for recording and representing are in the beginnings category. And then we have some that are developing and some that are applying. And so you can kind of get a good sense based off of self-evaluation data where are the strengths in your building on each one of the instructional elements? This is remember off of teacher self-reflection data, as well as maybe where are the areas that you wanna have um, some, some professional development or some site-wide focus on if you have a lot of self teachers self-reflecting that maybe they're um, not doing that particular strategy very well. So there's lots of different ways that you can kind of start to use that teacher self-reflection data to make decisions as an instructional leader in, in a school. Um, but at Flynn, the way that we did this is um, every teacher, after they self evaluated on the entire model, remember our model has 60 different instructional elements, uh, they would choose three different elements that they want to, uh, to, to try to become uh, uh, applying or, or innovating on a score three or a score four. And, and I always let the teachers decide which elements they wanted to choose, but the, the, each teacher had to constantly be working toward three elements at a time. So let's say that a teacher uh, decides that providing proficiency scales was an element that they self-assessed as a zero, one, or two. They're not at that, at that uh, uh, um, applying or innovating stage yet. The first thing that they're going to do is they're going to say, I want to have providing proficiency scales be one of my professional goals this year. And so then each one of the elements has a folio attached to it. And a folio is a, uh, a maybe a 20 to 30 page PDF document that the Marzano Academies has created that goes into what is the purpose of this particular instructional element and what are instructional strategies? And this is the key part, these strategies right here that you can do as a teacher to, to apply or innovate this particular instructional element. And so teachers would, would study the folios of the instructional elements that they've identified as their three professional goals that they're gonna start out the year with. And let's say that this teacher says, you know, I'm gonna try understanding the nature of proficiency scales with my students. So they're going to then try to um, implement this instructional strategy inside of their class. And so they can go in and learn more about what exactly do these strategies look like. And so this is inside the folio as well. You can see that uh, identify the focus of standards. So this would be a particular strategy that they can go learn about. And then what they decide to do is they're gonna track their progress over time. And so this is the, the tracker, tracker, excuse me, the strategy tracker right here that is a reproducible. And at Flynn, all of our teachers had their own data notebooks, just like students have uh, data notebooks where they track their assessment um, scores and set goals on, their, on how they'd like to academically achieve through the year. 
we had all of our teachers actually keep data notebooks of their professional goal setting. And so these tracking progress over time sheets, you can see an example of here's one that's actually filled out is this teacher, Mr. Abbott, his instructional strategy that he was gonna try was engaging students um, for specific metacognitive. And he initially said, I'm a three, but my goal is to be a four by December 1st, 2018. And then you can see that these are the dates that he actually went in and he tried different instructional strategies from the folio. And you can see that he, he did these and then he self-assessed how did that particular strategy go? So he did a goal lesson with Nearpod on October 15th and that one went really well. He, he believed that he was an innovating teacher with that particular day's strategy implementation. And then you can see he did wow goals on 1017. And that one, when he implemented that strategy, it was only an applying. He, he didn't make it up to the innovation. But you can see that he tracked his progress over time. And eventually he got to the point where he believed, I am a, uh, I am a, a score three or maybe even a score four teacher on this. And then that's when he would notify me as the principal, hey, I'd like to have you come in and actually watch me do a lesson with these metacognitive skills. And I've, I've been tracking my progress over time. I've got six different strategy implementation dates that I feel went really well. And I'm, I'm ready for you to come in and, and see how it looks. And so then I would go in and watch him do one of these strategies. And then if it was in fact as good as he's, he's self-evaluating here, then I would go ahead and say, um, you are a, a score four teacher on this and put that into the official teacher evaluation. And so that's where we can take the teacher progress and professional goal setting and transfer that to the evaluation. These are some other examples of, of how we uh, have done this, uh, had teachers post their professional goals outside their classroom. And, and not only to share with other teachers in the building, but also to show the kids to model with their students, just like we're asking you guys to set your own goals and track your progress inside of uh, student data notebooks. I too am setting my own professional goals and tracking my progress in a teacher data notebook. And so um, there are lots of different ways that you can have teachers set and, and track progress towards their goals. So now that we have the teacher's self-evaluation data and we have the teacher's setting goals, we're now gonna move into how do you translate this into a classroom observation system? And so um, the first part of this is that because there's 49 instructional elements in Dr. Mar Marzano's uh, inst uh, instructional model, that's a lot of elements to be observing for and putting down scores. And so Dr. Marzano, do you mind kind of talking about how you decided to uh, create observational categories from specific elements? All right, sure. The, um, yeah, it's important to make a distinction now. If you're using this model or any other model, the one that you've created, and it's strictly for development purposes, then the important part is for each of the elements, you know, teachers rate themselves, get feedback on that. Uh, and over the, over the years, you help teachers develop because they become better at more of the elements in your model. However, when you move over to saying, okay, we want to actually use our model as a measurement tool for teachers, perhaps to be used as our evaluation system, then it brings on a whole other set of issues. One we've already mentioned is that well, if you have a, uh, many elements, which you need for a good developmental, good developmental model, what does it do to the system of evaluation when you have to uh, have scores that are generated for each teacher uh, on your model? And 49 elements are too many. They really are. Um, what's the right number? Well, in you know, my experience, 49 is too many. But if you get up around 30, you know, mid-30s, you know, it actually can be done, not in a single year, but over time. Now, to that end, what we did uh, uh, was to take elements that had a like effect and organize those into a single category. So if you look at uh, element 23 and 24, notice and reacting when students are not engaged in increasing response rates. Those really both have this, in general, have the same goal of making, uh, helping students pay attention. So that the categories to the right, we call observational categories. Uh, and 
Now, what this allows you to do is when gathering data for a teacher, you don't have to get and, and there in this our model, there are 33 observational categories. So now you do not have to gather observational data on all 49 elements, you know, because what you're summarizing across the elements is, you know, look at the, the observational categories summarize, you know, what's going on. Um, and what this also implies is that let's take a look at energy. You know, that's a, an observational category, but there are three possible, excuse me, four, four, I can't read, <laughs> three elements uh, that go along with that, using physical movement, maintaining a lively pace, uh, pace and de demonstrating intensity and enthusiasm. A teacher could satisfy, you know, the, uh, the, uh, the score necessary for energy by using only one of those, you know, maybe maintaining a, li a, li a lively pace. So, uh, the, 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 you use the observational categories uh, uh, when you've changed from, hey, we just want to make sure teachers are developing to we have to create scores for these teachers, you know, and then aggregate, uh, aggregate those scores. So it strictly came out of the whole teacher evaluation movement, started with Race to the Top, realizing that you cannot have too many scores on a teacher. You can't require too many scores. You just don't have enough time to collect it. And so it was strictly done for pragmatic reasons, but it, it works actually pretty well. It, it, it does. And, and from a practitioner's standpoint, the nice thing that's about, uh, the, about this is we'll just stick with energy here for a second, is I might, I might observe one teacher who's fantastic at using physical movement. And so I might score them as a score three or even a score four during a classroom observation in their class. And by doing that, they actually sat, they, they satisfy the, they have now demonstrated a proficiency or a competency in the ability to generate energy, which is the observational category, even though I have not um, made an observation score on maintaining a lively pace or demonstrating intensity and enthusiasm. And so what this does is it really allows us to, to get a little bit more strategic with if we can group like instructional elements together, it reduces the amount of observations we have to do to get a good picture of where a teacher's competency is. Now, some instructional elements, like, for instance, providing scales, we've been talking about that one already, that is the only element in that, in that observational category. It does not share that observational category with any other elements because it is um, a, a critical piece of instruction, and it can only be satisfied by providing scales to students communicating the learning outcome. There are no other instructional elements built into a, to the instructional model that achieve that same purpose. So some observational categories may only have one designated instructional element, while others like energy here have three designated instructional elements that comprise up the energy. So it is a, a, um, a little bit different. And we can see that, um, here, so this is now um, all the instructional elements once again, and we have percents of, of the percent of teachers that have uh, been observed as a three or a four. So in this case, um, providing scales, that's this first element. That is 32% of teachers have, be, have uh, been observed at a score three or score four, or I should say have an overall score of that um, in the school. And, uh, and then this little bullseye means that it's actually a school-wide goal, that, that this is one of the school-wide goals, so you can denote that right here. But notice how these three right here have this kind of line that attaches them. That means that these three elements are, are together in one instructional observational category. And so you, you, a teacher could be um, scored right here or right here or right here, and they would get a summative score for all three of these um, for this instructional uh, observational category. And so this is kind of a way to be able to see where the elements come together. Here's one that has just two, here's another three, but you'll see, for instance, with providing proficiency scales, right, the, the design area proficiency scales, each one of these instructional elements is its own observational category. Same with assessments down here. Um, so that's just kind of a, a unique part about this observation. Um, so, Scott, we're going to now hop into what this looks like inside of the Empower system. Yeah. 
So um, as uh, uh, our continuing theme when we uh, deal with technology is, again, gathering the evidence, answering that question, uh, where, um, where are the learners now? And um, uh, uh, we last left with the, um, uh, the teacher creating a self-eval. Now what we're seeing here is uh, that self-eval gets sent to the site leader. Um, and um, they review it. And you can see um, they get a um, uh, something a little bit additional. They get a, uh, an item off to the right that says verify. Um, so what, what they're able to do is they're able to review this. And if they agree with it, they could check it. They could say, yes, yes, I agree with that. And well, what would that do? Well, what that does is um, it actually is uh, kind of certifies, if you will, where the learner is, in this case, the teacher, on the overall score. And what we want to keep in mind um, from a data standpoint is we're collecting evidences. Think of that kind of um, in one bucket. We're collecting evidences and we're using all of those evidences to make a determination overall on that particular element where do we, I'll use a strong term, certify, where do we, um, where would we agree that a teacher's learning really is? Now, in this case, we took an evidence and the teacher said that they're at a beginning stage and the, um, the site leader said, uh, verified it and um, um, kind of uh, certified it, if you will, just trying to stress the point there, that, um, and that would be what the overall actual score for that element is. Um, and that's that's one way that um, we would gather evidences. Another way that we would gather evidences is uh, is going to be a site leader initiated feedback. And they're going to go in and they would use the same exact form. But what they might do is go in with uh, their laptop or their um, uh, iPad and uh, maybe make a classroom observation. And um, again, as they're making the observation, they can click on the different descriptors to see exactly what, you know, what um, uh, the elements are that you are, are going to be looking for, the characteristics, the criteria, and they can make their, um, um, they can make their assessment or uh, just by clicking on whatever the numbers are. Um, and again, a workflow would ensue once they finish this, the teacher would get an alert, they could see how they were reviewed. And if they wanted to, let's say they had a, um, uh, they might have uh, um, uh, been a little bit uh, in a disagreement with what was said, they could maybe self advocate, they can say, hey, listen, I know you dropped in my classroom, um, you're there for five or 10 minutes, but what you didn't see in that short amount of time is, and they could continue with showing maybe a video or um, a, a text or whatever. And, um, and based off of that, you know, uh, a site leader could maybe change their score. Um, and, um, and there's just um, the whole exercise again, is trying to collect the evidence. Um, and so we have that second way, first way, teacher self-eval, second way, site administrator self-eval. Um, and if you don't mind, if we could go to um, uh, maybe maybe uh, two back, I'm sorry. Yeah, or I'm sorry, one more back with the chart. Um, so what you end up getting um, as a site leader is you start to see your site as a whole of how all of the teachers' knowledge kind of aggregates up, and um, and you can start to see where the true needs for your organization um, are, and uh, and based on that, you might um, you you would uh, be armed with information to probably get and select really useful site goals for your organization. Remember, we said that there's uh, two types of goals. There's a site goal established by obviously the site leader. And then there's individual goals. Um, here you see the little blue um, dot or target. Um, that just uh, indicates on, on the very top and on the very bottom, there's, those are the, um, those are the uh, established elements that uh, the site leader decided to choose and make those goals. Um, a goal is basically like a performance task, an activity, um, and it too can be scored, and that would give us our third um, uh, uh, 
uh, evidence. Uh, so there's three different categories of evidence, and that would be our third type of evidence that we would gather to make the determinations of, um, of answering that question. What do our learners know now? So one thing I want to highlight here is um, this is a, a key piece, I think, to using a very complicated instructional model when you are using it for classroom observation purposes. Um, and, and I'm going to speak from, a, from being a principal here using this is we when you have 60 instructional elements or in Dr. Marzano's case, 49 instructional elements, each with their own scale. And you can see right here, this is the scale for, for a score two for providing scales. And this is the, the scale for a score three. It is very difficult, even, even if you are a absolute instructional expert as a principal, assistant principal, instructional coach, to know each one of these scales, like the back of your hand. And so what's nice about when you have it built into a, a platform is, and these hover overs, you can't, we're not live right now, but if I were in a classroom observation, this would be what we would see. If I hovered my mouse over developing, this pop-up box pops up and I can now read what is the rubric definition for a teacher who is developing on providing scales, or I can hover over the applying and then this pop-up box pops up and I can read what a rubric definition is for a teacher who is applying. And so that really is a useful tool um, because what ends up happening is when we started this out initially, I'm gonna jump here ahead, this was what we started with. And this is a paper version of, of the, uh, this is for each one of the design areas is you can walk in and um, if you're doing a classroom observation is I'm gonna, is the teacher communicating scales? That's element one right there. And so I would say, I think the teacher's communicating scales but I'm not quite sure because I don't have the teacher rubrics with me right now. I think they are, maybe not. Are, this, is the uh, are the students tracking progress? Are they celebrating success? These are the first three instructional elements that are built into proficiency scales. And so when you have a paper version, you don't have the ability unless you, um, and so then what we did is we created uh, this particular element tracker right here, same idea, proficiency scales, tracking student progress and, element, and, and uh, celebrating success, which are the first three elements over here in feedback. And you can, you know, mark bubble in two when you're in the classroom. Maybe they're doing a three here. Maybe you don't see assessment even occurring. So you put those all as not, um, excuse me, uh, you would leave them blank. But one of the advantages when you end up with uh, it inside of a platform is you can see the actual scale for the applying in this case and for the developing, which helps your instructional leadership in your buildings and in your districts actually learn the instructional model while they are in classrooms observing that instructional model. And, and I can say that I became an expert in the Westminster instructional model once I was in classrooms weekly observing for the instructional elements within that model, hovering over the developing box and being able to read the scale while I'm inside of a classroom and asking, is the teacher doing this? Or, you know, or even better, I can go ask the students, Oh, that, that's the question I need to ask kids to make sure that this teacher really is applying. And so having that available when you are in the classroom observation itself is a huge advantage. So like I said, when we put this into practice, initially we uh, started with a paper version. And it's important to understand when you are doing the uh, classroom observations, you always wanna start with the score two developing. And so you're going to look at the proficiency scale and you're going to say, is the teacher developing um, at, at the very minimum doing the teacher actions of this particular instructional element? If they are, then you would go up to, um, to the score three, sorry. And you would say, okay, the teacher's doing all of the teacher actions, but are the majority of students actually exhibiting the, the practice as well? And if that answer is, is yes, then you can say they're for sure in applying, and then you move up to the innovating. Now is, are they doing everything that's in the score three plus, is it having um, the desired effects, right? And, and so let's say you start with the, with the developing on stage two and you say the teacher's not actually 
doing all of the things that they should be doing to be even a developing teacher, then you move down to the, to the beginning. And are they doing the beginning stage? And if that's a yes, then they would be marked a one instead of a two. And so there's different ways that you can design this. Here's one that we did. It says you can see start here at developing. And so you always start in this column. And if the teacher is doing this, then you move left to applying. If they're not doing this, then you move right to beginning. And uh, another example of this that we did in Westminster in terms of having it be from our instructional model, these are paper versions, remember. Now, once you get these done, you can um, uh, use these to generate summative scores. These would be observational scores from your building or, or even from a district. And we'll show what that looks like in a minute. And so this is an example of here's proficient, providing proficiency scales and the summative scores of all the observations that we had in the building that year was a 1.95. So just shy of two. So a majority of the teachers were right at a two. And you can see this across for each one of the elements, we were able to generate summative scores um, and, uh, based off of our instructional observations using the instructional model. Um, there is a, a, an easier way to do this when it's built into a digital platform. And so the example of this would be when we have it built into the digital platform, we have the observation tool instead of being paper-based, it is actually um, inside the tool. So now I can start with developing, and this is where I'm always gonna start. And then I'm gonna say, is the teacher developing on providing scales? If yes, I'm gonna move to applying and look if, they, if the students are doing that practice. If the teacher is not doing the developing, I'm gonna move left to beginning. And then let's say uh, the teacher is in fact, in this case, a beginning, I'll just click on the beginning, it'll highlight that, and that becomes the observation score for that teacher on that day on tracking student progress. Once again, when you're in the classroom using an actual digital tool you, you, versus the paper-based, you can hover over, because I'm like, I'm not sure what was be developing for the providing skills again. It's been a while since I've looked at that teacher rubric. I can hover over and I can read exactly what the teacher should be doing in order to make the decision. Do I move right to applying, left to beginning, or just mark the teacher as a straight two? And so that's kind of the power of being able to take the instructional model into the classroom through classroom observations. And then once again, it's going to provide us with a summative score of how each, how the building's collective teachers off of observation scores are doing um, for that year. And you'll notice that these are all kind of low. You think, man, how does it only 56% of teachers? But remember, these are actual observed scores from classroom observations. And so, you know, um, summative assessments right here, the fourth element in, in assessment, oftentimes, maybe a majority of the time when you walk in to do a classroom observation of a teacher, they are not going to be doing a summative assessment. And so it's not that only 12% of teachers are proficient in de delivering summative assessments. It's that only 12% of the teachers have been directly observed as proficient on using summative assessments. And this is where that evergreen data really starts to come into play is when you really think about a complex instructional model with 49 different elements, it could possibly take years of observational data to be able to uh, see every single teacher in your building actually delivering a summative assessment through a direct observation. And so that's where that evergreen uh, data becomes important. You don't want all of your observation data to get erased at the end of the year because the academic year is over. All of these observations actually carry over to the next year. And we start as a, as a principal, I'm gonna start with these observed practices still in from the year before. Um, and so you can see if you were to actually hover over and click on this 40, it would actually pull up the number of teachers. In this case, three teachers we've, we've observed as a three, seven teachers we've observed as a two, seven teachers we've observed as a one, and eight teachers we've never seen through direct observation this particular instructional element happening. That does not mean that these eight teachers aren't doing that instructional element. It just means that a, a direct observation of this instructional element with those eight teachers has not been, has not occurred.
Real quick, Brian. Um, one thing to note here. So on the mouse over, absolutely, you get the um, the breakout. The numbers there represent your, your number of teachers you have at each scoring level. Um, the uh, percentage is based on the percentage of your staff that are at a three or above. So applying or above. Um, so when you've got like um, whatever it is, 40%, 12%, um, you may have a lot of teachers engaged, but only 40% of your teachers are at that three or above. Um, and then, of course, if you look at something like this and you're like, um, well, I've got eight individuals, eight uh, teachers that haven't had any scores, you just click on it and then you get the full detail. It's like a report and it would show you um, all of the teachers, the three teachers that have that score three. Seven teachers have the score too. And then you can see the eight teachers who hadn't had any scores at all. And you might be able to say, all right, well, next on my um, on my um, uh, feedback walk, when I go to visit classrooms, I need to give attention here. So again, kind of helping you as a leader, you know, know where, know where to go in, in the state of your, uh, your school. Perfect, thanks, Scott. Uh, Dr. Gatto, do you want to take, discuss how we took this kind of uh, observational practice of an instructional model and moved it to the district level? Sure. Um, so we look at this from kind of three different levels. Um, we have our district um, level observations, which um, one of the unique things that we put in place just to help our district and school leaders learn the instructional model is district learning walks. Um, and so we blanket the district um, one Thursday a month where every Dean and above, so our deans, APs, principals, um, directors, and we included our procurement directors, our maintenance directors, everybody, uh, because in our system, we consider it a, a competency-based system. So all of those individuals are involved in, in these learning walks. And so we did it um, starting out with the paper pencil version. Um, and again, after you know having 80 people in the schools every Thursday, you start to gather a pretty substantial amount of data um, to be able to start seeing where we have strengths and weaknesses, areas for improvement um, that we can start defining our professional learning plans around. Um, so these are, initially we didn't have a fantastic tool like um, what Scott has built for us. Um, and so we just had to use Google Forms, which is an, an okay way to start. Um, but it did allow us to immediately at the end of each one of those visits, be able to dig in and look at that data and have principals have that external check of here's what I'm seeing in my building based on the goals and what teachers are working on um, and to get that outside look. Um, and then we also have at the school level, this is a, a quick screenshot of what those um, school averages look like. So again, for each one of those elements, we had um, data again, monthly, and then we kept this going throughout the year to be able to see where um, each one of our schools and each of us as a system um, an overall system where we saw areas that we could um, continue to work on. So um, all of those, we had the district learning walks, then the principals had their school um, teacher self-evaluations, their building walkthroughs, um, and teacher instructional rounds, and then our teachers set their professional goals. So all of those pieces kind of working together to strengthen the model um, and to check for those practices, getting back to Scott's question is where are our teachers at in that learning continuum? Um, and how do we as a system support them to continue to grow? Because as it has been mentioned, 60 elements for us is quite a bit. Um, but again, we're not looking for proficiency in one year. That the beauty of this system, both for our students and our for teachers, is that we look at this over time um, and not that everything has to be completed in a, the magic of one year. Great, thank you. All right, so we've mentioned a couple of times, and this is a key piece is that as Dr. Marzano discussed earlier, that the research would show that in order to be able to observe, um, even have a chance at observing a majority of instructional strategies that a teacher actually is responsible for across the, the course of a school year, a minimum of 10 classroom observations. And I think most of you guys that are, are school leaders or maybe even district leaders that were school leaders at one time, you know that getting into uh, to do 10 formal classroom observations in a year uh, it is probably not going to happen. And so one thing that's important to think about when we look at the classroom observation system is that teacher input should and needs to be part of the evaluation scores, as well as the development process that the teachers move through. 
And so we're gonna kind of walk you through how teacher input can be determined. Um, Scott, this is uh, the teachers, uh, uh, we call it a target browser, but essentially each one of these is, here's that providing scales again. And so the teacher, um, this is the teacher's version of what they would see on each one of the instructional elements. Each one of these tiles is an instructional element that the teacher is responsible for. And so Scott, I'll have you kind of walk through what each one of these uh, uh, pieces of data looks like for each cell. Yeah, sure. So um, if you remember when we were looking at the graph, there was a bunch of small boxes. Now this is that graph basically blown up. Um, each one of those boxes are now bigger. You can see um, the name of each element in here. And this is kind of like a general information resource center. So this is the entire model of 49 elements. Um, plus, um, if you add your own school elements like Westminster did, it goes, you know, I think they have 60, um, broken into the, the different design areas. And um, for each one of these, if you click on, um, if you click on the title, you get the full rubric, the scoring guide. Remember the twos and the threes and what all that looks like. Um, there is a um, point in here with the arrow. Um, there's a box that has your current score. So this, with all those evidences and calculating, um, you know, kind of a definitive. What uh, do I, as a professional learner, what do I know now on this particular skill element? It shows me that right there. The, the next item right, ne uh, right by it is the number of, um, of observations, whether they be a self-evaluation or a professional observation. It's like a um, kind of like a backpack of all the observations that have ever been done for me on that element. If I wanted to, I could click that. It would give me a list, a whole history, and I could click on a specific one and then look again at that full uh, feedback form. Um, so I got all the history there. And then the final item off to the right is going to be uh, the resource uh, link to the folios. And those are those wonderful folios that um, uh, Dr. Marzano has put together that really, really goes in depth about the strategies, um, the, you know, the uh, detailing. What does it look like for me to be a teacher to do this? It takes those rubrics and really expands it so that you can, um, you can, um, you know, be definitive in making sure you are equipped to hit those milestones, being able to go from what's my responsibility and seeing that outcome in the in the students. So let's talk about how we did this and what this looks like at, at Flynn. So let's just stick with this example. So the teacher identifies that they have um, a, a scale they want to submit evidence for. And so we'll do providing scales here. So that teacher is going to jump into the folio and they're going to look at the different strategies. And you can see that one of the strategies for providing proficiency scales is to design student-friendly versions of proficiency scales. So I might go in as a principal and observe, and I just, I didn't see a, a, a student-friendly proficiency scale. I just didn't see that. So I marked them, let's say, as a two. The teacher's doing all the actions. I, I don't see any students doing it. So then that teacher can come back and say, but wait a minute, I am actually doing uh, student-friendly uh, student proficiency scales. So they can submit this as a piece of evidence. And so here's an example of a student-friendly proficiency scale from my class. And you can see that in this case, the, the, and this is actual, this is a real example of one submitted to me last year. This is the actual scale. These are the score twos that come up to this score three for comparing text. And then here's the score twos that come up to this score three for describing the main idea themes relationship. And then you can see down here example evidences that the teacher gave to the kids on their student friendly proficiency scale of how they will demonstrate competency. Here's the vocabulary for this particular proficiency scale where the kids can write down the meaning and they can self rate their their understanding of that vocab term up here they're going to track their evidence. Um, as they move towards uh, proficiency. Why is this important for me? Kids can reflect here. They can set a goal on this particular proficiency scale. They can identify what they don't understand yet or I'm not good at yet, and then the key concepts. And then of course they can revise. And so the teacher submitted this and said, here's my student friendly version of a proficiency scale. And even though you didn't see it in your direct observation, I have these, I'm using these every single day and they're inside of students' data notebooks. 
And so after this gets submitted as a piece of evidence, I can look at it. I might go in and take a peek at a couple of the data notebooks to make sure they are there and being used. And if they are and they're being used, then that this is a, a score for innovating practice of providing scales to students. And so I could go into the system then, and you can see I could achieve, the teacher's now gonna have a 4.0 for this particular um, instructional element, even though we didn't observe the in student from the proficiency scales in action in class. So it's a nice thing to be able to get, teachers can get credit for those things they're doing, even if they didn't happen to be observed during a classroom observation. All right, last piece before we wrap up here is, so now we have all these data. We have the teacher self-evaluation data. We have uh, uh, observation data. We have teachers submitted evidence. How does this all calculate to an overall effectiveness rating over time? And so I'm going to hand this um, over to Scott to kind of walk through how um, Empower uses several different algorithms to determine what is the best particular summative score for a teacher. Yeah, great. Thanks, Brian. So um, at, at, remember this concept of kind of figuring out, using the evidence to, to make a determination for that element, you know, where the student or the learner truly is on that. So it's not just the evidence itself, it's kind of, you know, the, uh, the aggregate of it. Well, um, uh, Dr. Marzano and um, Bob, please feel free to, um, to uh, uh, add comments here. Um, he put together a um, uh, kind of uh, a, a scoring, I don't know if you use the word algorithm, but a, uh, a scoring approach where there are three different predictive learning patterns. Um, each one of these learning patterns is, um, is represented, you know, mathematically. For instance, an average, which uh, would, would um, in, uh, indicate that there is a learning pattern of not learning, stays flat. So that's one approach. Um, there is the, uh, the linear, which is a learning pattern that um, you get, um, you know, consistent acceleration or um, increase of learning. And then there is um, a power law, um, which is um, an assumption that um, you know learning's happening, maybe still stable, uh, but then there might be like an aha moment, and then it starts to curve up. Um, and in that model, it takes the um, uh, it weights heavier the latter um, evidences, and I, I, as we said, each one of those has a uh, has a prediction. And um, it, it looks and sees how the, um, um, the, the data compares it to the prediction. And the model that has the least uh, margin of error is what we would end up calling the true score. And, um, and so, so the outcome of this, the, we're using technology to be able to um, help manage this determination using data and analyzing the data to be able to give that determination of what the uh, the learner truly knows now based on evidences. And Bob, please, whatever you would add there. Uh, yeah, I just reiterate it. Yeah, it's, you know, realize that the idea here is that over time, you'll be gathering more data points for each teacher on each one of the elements. And the more data points, the more complex it becomes to just look at the data and say, well, this says there are three. Why not let mathematics help us out? So you know, what Scott's uh, uh, in, uh, programmed into the system is we use three mathematical models. You know, the average, you know, uh, the linear model, which indicates, you know, consistent growth over time and the curvilinear model, which indicates you start start very strong, but tends to ta taper off. And I, I, li I like to think of this as an app. You know, I, I say you know, my cell phone here that, that will tell me how many steps I've taken in a day. It will tell me if I enter the data, how many calories I've eaten. Why not? Uh, and that helps me make decisions. Why not have built, why don't we have built into the system, you know, mathematics that helps the evaluator in this case, you know, evaluators make a decision as what's the most appropriate summative score for the teacher on each element at, at any point in time. And, and it's important to note here that the, the more the more um, each one of these 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 dots is a piece of evidence that went in for this teacher. These are the self eval evidences, and then the rest of these are classroom observations or or evidences the teacher submitted and the principal accepted as as an evidence toward um, proficiency. 
the more data that you have, the, the more powerful that these, um, these algorithms can actually help you to determine where is a teacher. But you'll notice here that the linear has this teacher at a 3.0 with all of these data inputs in place. The power law is a 3.0, but the average is a 2.0. And so then the system says, based off of what we have, the linear is the preferred, most accurate, um, mathematically speaking, proficiency scale score for this teacher. With that said, inside of the system, the principal still has control to determine the overall score for each teacher on each instructional element. So this is suggestive only. It's not, doesn't automatically become the score. The principal determines the overall score um, using this particular information. But as a principal, it is really nice to be able to see these three computational um, uh, equations give me an, what does the math say this student is, or this teacher is, excuse me, based off of their uh, evidences that have been inputted in. Uh, so, that leads us to the end of the of the show. We do have a little bit of time. Looks like about five minutes for questions. And so, um, if anybody has any questions, I guess I can look here at the chat too. I haven't. Nope. Looks like we don't have any um, anything in the chat. Uh, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? All right, wait time on Zoom is always a little awkward. All right, going once, going twice. All right, sold. Thank you everybody for attending our session today. We hope that it was informative and, and maybe gets you thinking a little bit about how you can either A, design out a competency-based instructional model, and then more importantly, once you have designed out a competency-based instructional model, how you can start to use that model in your teacher development and evaluation processes. Um, thank you so much. Have a great day.